Hi, I'm Charlie Morton. I am one of the ICE TMEs, and we're going to talk about uh, 3.4. It's June, so this is about the time that we talk about what's new in the next release coming up. And this year we're going to do 3.4, and everybody's question that they have on their mind is, you know, what is coming up for ICE in the future as far as everything goes, right? So as far as everything goes, you know, this is today. We're at June 20th, and at the end of this month, we have a last day to support for our 3500 series appliances. So you need to keep that date in mind if you are running the 3500 series. But in July, we also have an end of software maintenance for ICE 3.0. No patches or fixes are going to be put out after that date for 3.0, and then last day of summer for the Northern Hemisphere is September 22nd, and that's when ICE 2.7 reaches end of support. So that's anything that has to do with 2.7, there's no support whatsoever once that date hits. So if you are running on any one of these three items, just remember that it's now time to upgrade whatever you have. Big news for everyone who hasn't been to Cisco Live this year is that 3.3 patch 2 is now the suggested release. Uh, that's a big deal because everyone's been waiting for that, and it's actually out a lot sooner than 3.4 is going to be released. So that's good news for everybody out there. For some of the features that are coming out for 3.3, we've got this whole summary dashboard here. Um, the official stance for the release for 3.4 is that it's coming out in summer of 2024. Now that's because we are all based in the US as far as the uh, product management team goes. So summer 2024 means, you know, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Thomas Howard chastised me as we were going through this and saying, you know, Australia is going to get really upset when I say that. So that's our official stance. I've updated this slide to kind of help out with that so that I don't want to make anybody angry. Um, so these are the dates that cover summer 2024. And my best guesstimate is we're actually going to try to get this released right in the middle of summer 2024, which is going to cover these two weeks. So anywhere from July 25th to August 7th is the hopeful dates that we're going to be able to see ICE 3.4 on our software downloads page. So now let's get on to these new features that everybody wants to know about. And the first one that got everyone excited in our open beta room is that we have improved our restart times for ICE 3.4. Now, the commands that are used for these times is you do the application stop ISE and then you do reload. After you press yes for the confirmation of the reload, that's when these timers start. You see how slow this bar comes into the window because it's, you know, 20 minutes to reload ICE 3.2. Improved it a little bit with 3.3. But now with 3.4, we put a lot of time and effort into getting that to go a lot faster. And this is actually a screenshot that I shared in the open beta room from my phone when I timed the restart for, for the ICE beta software. And it was fantastic. Uh, I was totally surprised with this because there was no documentation about it. And, you know, it caught us off guard because it reloaded a lot faster. So I figured I would time it. I'm going to go and show a demo of this. It's going to be sped up, of course, because you don't want to sit here for five minutes and just look at the screen. It's going to go through about 30 seconds of a sped up demo so you can see it. So as you can see, I'm going to do the application stop ice. And then once all the processes have stopped, I'm going to issue the reload command. All right, now we have the reload command issued. Now continue with reboot. I'm going to press Y. And then as soon as I hit enter, the timer starts. Now, every time you see the screen flash, that's when I'm refreshing the browser so I can get the application server to initialize the screen. And then as soon as that login prompt comes up on the GUI, that's when the timer stops. And I'm a couple seconds even faster on this demo when I recorded it than I was the first time I recorded it. So 
around five and a half minutes is what you're going to be looking at for restarting your ice 3.4 fantastic improvement hope everybody likes it but coming back to this slide we're going to have people say okay well what if i don't want to do the application stop ice before i do the reload well i also timed that and if we use just the reload command then it adds a one minute, 13 seconds to your reload time. So stopping the process and doing the reload doesn't really add that much time. You're still under seven minutes to reload your ice node. So hopefully everybody is making great uh, clapping hands and all that in the Q&A here, because this is one thing that a lot of people have been asking for for a lot of time. Something else that people have been asking for is Persistent changes in the UI. I know this sounds a little vague, but that's because it covers a couple different items here. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to go and we're going to find a table within ICE that we can make some changes to. So heading over to context visibility endpoints, we know there's tables there, and we're going to use this as one of our base tables that we do. Now, we're going to adjust the column widths on these tables. And we're going to do location and IP address. Let's go ahead and adjust those so they're wider and we don't have to worry about that. Go back to the dashboard. Then we're going to go over here. We're going to find another table. We're going to do that with our PS Grid Direct connectors, say. So once we go in here, we're going to say, you know, the name is truncated. So let's widen that, pull that out a bit. And then the you know, connector type as well, so we can read the whole title. Now, once we do that, let's go back to our contact visibility endpoints. And you see IP address and location are still the same width that we had changed them to. Let's go ahead and change another one here and go back to PS Grid Direct Connectors. And look, our name and our connector type are still the wide uh, columns that we had changed it to. Now we're going to change our total objects and references. Go back to the contact visibility. Our status is still the same. And we come back here, you can see that our total objects and references are still the same as well. Now, the next thing that we're going to show is you can move your columns and the columns will stay in the location you move them to. So you see I'm moving the host name and the endpoint profile columns. If we go back over to our handy dandy PS Grid Direct Connectors, it makes more sense to me if we have the sync status before our last sync and our sync now buttons. So if we do that and then we check our columns now, you can see that our column changes have been persisted throughout. If we log out and log back in, the changes are still the same because they are tied to the user profile who's logging into ICE. Another one that's big for Trusec and anybody who's using SGTs to segment the network. We have done something that removes the need for a pack based transfer of information. What that means is, all right, so we're using any device that runs the current iOS XE, which is 17.14. whatever. And the way that Communication is established is that once you add that device into ICE, it's going to send a request to ICE for a pack request. ICE will say, okay, right, here's your pack, and it's going to send that pack over to your switch, your device. And then the device is going to open up a tunnel to ICE that sends the CTS pack okay, opaque information, and we'll talk about that in a moment, so that it knows that the challenge and the response is the same. So the CTS pack opaque is going to match what is on ICE. So they know it's a secure challenge or secure channel that they can talk to. Yes, it's a TLS tunnel, which is great for security, but it's a TLS 1.0 tunnel, which is not so great for security. So once we get the access challenge back, then we can do the whole authentication and move on to ICE. We're concerned about this part here, so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, now, if you're not sure what a CTS pack opaque is, 
if you issue the command show CTS packs, it'll give you all this information. And then you have this encrypted pack opaque field here. And this is the information that is sent to ICE. ICE decrypts it, says yes, it's a match, and then it establishes the communication and, and you can move forward. Now what has happened is with iOS 17.15.1, which is not yet released, it's coming soon, we have initiated what is called packless radius communication. So the act, access request is sent. Um, the pack is also sent from the network device, but it's also got this new field that it's sending, this CTS pack capability equals CTS pack less. So it's, the device is telling ICE that I can do this without a pack, can you? With ICE 3.4, it says, all right, so this device is packless, so I'm gonna ignore the pack that it's sent and then it's gonna send back a challenge that says, hey, guess what? I am also packless. So the switch says, all right, well, you ignored my pack. You say you're packless, so I'm gonna mark you as packless as well. So from then on, they're gonna speak without using a pack. So another access is sent using a radius shared secret. So now instead of using a pack, we're using a radius shared secret to establish the communication. So that's sent, including the packless attribute. And then ICE marks that device as packless, didn't have a pack with it this time, so it just marks it as packless permanently within ICE itself. It evaluates the radio shared secret, see if it matches with the network device that's already been added to ICE. And then it sends that access challenge back. And then your authentication, your authorization happens after that. So this is one way that we have reduced some complexity with the TrustSec challenge system. And just now it's a full radius communication instead of TLS and a radius tunnel, radius through the TLS tunnel to get that communication going. Now, speaking of TLS, we've also added some more TLS 1.3 support. If you remember, ICE 3.3 introduced TLS support for your different portals and APIs, but now we're introducing TLS support for ETLS, TTLS, and secure TCP syslog. And this was such a big deal that once the development was done on this feature and it was tested out and it made it working correctly, then we also ported that back. It's already in ICE 3.3 patch two and you can use it today. Uh, that was released a few weeks ago and it's ready to be used. So that's another way that we're enhancing the security with the authentications within ICE. But now let's get into PS Grid Direct. Now, you know that Thomas and I and Pavon, we all love PS Grid Direct. We do a lot with it. Thomas has a whole webinar on how to use PS Grid Direct. Check that out. Full of a lot of information. Um, if you're not sure what PS Grid Direct is, it's a mechanism where you send a GET request to any database, ServiceNow, whatever. That, that application responds with a JSON response which we can then add the attributes into the ICE endpoint database and use those in authorization policy. If you want more detail about that, like I said, Thomas already did a webinar. This is the title of that webinar, and you can find it on our YouTube channel at the CSCO slash ICE dash videos link. What we've done differently is one of the big knocks on PS Grid Direct was the iteration for the synchronized synchronization intervals. You could only do it at the minimum of 12 hours. So if you wanted a six hour sync or a four hour sync, you were not able to do that. And with ICE 3.4, we've added a different feature here called an on-demand sync button. So beside any connector that you have, you have the option for this uh, link here that you can choose either a full sync or an incremental sync. So if you're using that incremental URL in your uh, PS Grid connector, 
PS Grid Direct connector, then you could use that as well. If you wanted to sync all of your connectors at one time, you would just you know select all your connectors by the check boxes on the left side and use the sync now button at top. And then that will give you the choice between the full and incremental syncs there as well. And also we've got some updates to the PX grid direct scale numbers. Now the first one is the 10 connectors. That was a maximum in ICE 3.3 and now it's just a recommended um maximum here uh, to have 10 connectors and 10 connectors only you can do more than that it depends on the number of connectors and the number of records in your connector as to whether it will slow down or have any effect on ice so that's the 10 connectors recommended the other one is the sheer scale of it itself is 200 or 2 million maximum endpoints this is updated from 500,000 maximum endpoints and this is per connector so it's not 2 million maximum endpoints through um all connectors together it's just it's going to go to the maximum endpoint number that we have within ice and the 15 through 20 attributes per connector, or it used to be 15 to 20 attributes recommended total. Now it's 15 to 20 attributes per connector that you can use within your authorization policies. But we're not done with PS Grid Direct yet. We have a new feature coming out, which is the PS Grid Direct URL pusher. And what this does that's different than PS Redirect itself is that there's no GET request. ICE does not send a GET request out at all. We get an API incoming to ICE in a JSON format. And we take that and we send that to our ICE persistent database. Notice that's not the endpoint database anymore. This is the persistent database. The big deal about that is that the endpoint database is purged when all your endpoints are purged your persistent database is not purged during your endpoint purge. And then we can use that in the authorization policy. I've got a quick demo here so that we can take a look at that and you can see how to set up your URL pusher for PX Grid Direct. Now we're gonna go same PX Grid Direct connectors as you would set up anything else. I'm gonna add this pusher in here. You give it any name that you want. Of course, I'm going to do something rather quick just for this webinar, and that's demo push. Now, URL fetcher is the common PS Grid Direct method. We're going to use pusher here. And now with the pusher, we have some RBAC built into it. So you can choose which admin groups have which rights to be able to read or to write using the APIs during the URL push. And then once you get your admin group set, we're going to move on to the next one. And this one, you want to get a single record from the application you're going to be sending. And if you see here, you can see I've got one record from my database that I'm going to be using. And I want to have all of these set within ISPH Grid Direct so that I know what fields are going to be incoming. And that's really what you're doing with this. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now that we have all those fields, you can see the ICE makes a correlation to each one of these, and then we can add the different fields into our dictionary. The dictionaries are the fields that we want to be able to create a policy on. So different things like MAC address, asset tag number, you can even do uh, SGTs, management groups. You know, if you want to have a different management group, have a different authorization policy, you can do that as well. So we're going to come down here. We're going to find a couple more attributes here. Um, let's see. We got yep, asset tag. That's that's an important one. That's going to be our correlation ID. And then oh, MAC address. There it is, all the way down at the bottom. All right. See if there's any more coming up. All right. I think that's it. Let's go ahead and move on. 
our unique identifier again is going to be that MAC address because it's you know a static assignment within our database. So let's find that MAC address. We got to search through everything to get to it, and then we're going to use the asset tag as our correlation identifier. Like I said. So what that JSON is doing is it's going to tell ICE the format that we're going to be using for the data structure in our APIs. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But here we go. We have our new demo push connector. We go into our dictionaries and we expand our system dictionaries and we look alphabetically. We have a demo push dictionary now within ICE. And these are all the different attributes that we selected when we were setting up that connector. Now that we have those attributes, and we have verified the dictionaries there. Let's go into our authorization policy. Let's create a new authorization rule. Now within the condition studio, we're going to add an attribute for our condition for this rule. And oh, we got to select the right dictionary, then we'll push. And we want to have, let's start with, you know, asset tag. That's going to be an easy one to do. Now, if it's going to be an asset tag, you want to use contains because you want to have, you know, you want to have that prefix for the asset tag, and then whatever comes afterward, you're going to have that as well. So we're just going to have the prefix for the asset tag here, and then once you do that, you can give whatever whatever permissions you want to to build that policy out, whatever. But this shows you how to use the attributes that we selected for that dictionary. In your authorization policy. Now, talking about the APIs, uh, if you want to see how to use the APIs or where they live, if you go into your API settings in ICE, you see that you have the for more information, use the Swagger interface here. And I have the full link to it down at the bottom of the page. But if you use that Swagger interface, this is within ICE itself. And you choose the PS Grid Direct uh, definition up at the top. These are going to show you all the different APIs that you can use for the PS Grid Direct push connectors. If you don't want to wait until 3.4 comes out and you want to see what those APIs are right now, we have them already published on DevNet. If you go to cs.co slash ice API, you can look for the PS Grid Direct. APIs there, and this will fall under the PS Grid Direct APIs that you can see on our uh, API documentation. Now, to break it down, this is what the API is going to look like when you send when your application or however you send it into ICE. You can have all of your headers at the top, the application JSON. Now, remember when we set the R back when we were setting up the connector. This is where you put that username and password for that user that you have created that has the rights to have read and write for this API. Once you set that, you put in all the information that you want to send into ICE, whether it's, you know, this is a bulk, so you can do the whole uh, database here if you want to send all of that and everything into ICE at one time. But this is how that API is going to be structured. So now we're going to move on to another feature that was announced at Cisco Live, and this is common policy. And what is common policy, basically, and why do we need it? Well, every um, technology that we have at Cisco has a different way of creating policies. Your SD-WANs, your secure access, your ACI for the data center. Everything has its own way of providing your segmentation or your policies and we really want to bring that in together so that there's a common policy and a common policy provider throughout all of our cisco offerings and what we've done here is the ice is going to be that single point of policy for common policy uh right now the name that Product marketing is kicking around is the context exchange hub. And really what that does is it allows ICE to translate what the 
different policies are for your different systems and assign an SGT to each one of those policies. So we'll talk about that more in depth about the ACI as far as data center goes, because that's the big one that we've been working on very hard for 3.4. But to give you an idea of what's coming up for policy roadmap and what we've done and where we're going, let's take a look at this quick roadmap. Now, I can say that in 3.2 was our first um, step toward common policy. And that was when we did the Meraki connector and we associated specific secure group tags to the Meraki adaptive policies. And that was our first step. Our next step, which is a big step, is with 3.4, we're going to have the ACI EPG and ESG translated to specific secure group tags. We have a uh, Catalyst Center uh, integration, uh, B Manage integration, and we're going to have these are all going to be based upon SGT translations to the policies in those systems. All right. Uh, this is more of a, a a controlled introduction to make sure we get all the feedback from everything that we can to make this a rock solid feature. And that's going to come in uh, hopefully patch one. But as you can see here, throughout the patches that we release for ICE 3.4, we're going to have more and more common policy integrations or, or feature sets that are going to come with it. We can't talk much more about that in the public forum like this, but that's our plans for the future of common policy. Now, sticking with the ACI, uh, you can see here down at the bottom right, if you use ICE 3.4 and ACI 6.11, we're going to be able to have a multi-tenant, multiple IC outs, multiple VRF, multiple anything to ICE that we can translate the EPGs and ESGs that we receive from the data center, and we can be able to deploy those SGTs back to those data centers so that we are controlling all of your policy right from ICE. Now, this is great for a brownfield environment, too, because all of your EPGs and your ESGs are already set. So ICE just reads those in and then forms a PS grid direct con or a PS grid connection to ACI and it transfers the context information with the SGTs and everything as well. We also have you know the policy enforcement in the data center and how is that policy enforcement going to happen? Well, first, like I said, we establish that connection to your APIC controller running ACI. The connection is established through APIs, and then we create that PX grid connection for the transfer of the context and SGTs. Once we do that, we can see all the EPGs, ESGs from ACI and assign them the SGTs. Then we can send those SGTs back over to ACI. They will be converted to the EPGs as well. So all of our SGGs will be converted to EPGs in your ACI. And then we can establish the corresponding contracts that will make all of this work so that every EPG that you want to have an SGT will have that. And you have that single point of policy where you create all of this within ICE. So you don't have to log into your ACI to do anything other than just, you know, the, the initial configuration, you have to know which L3 out, which tenants and all of that that you want to put into ICE. Then we can read all of that in and then you can do all of this within the ICE interface. To give you an idea of that, I'm going to show a quick demo on setting this up. Now, of course, there's going to be the ACI integration as well. If we go into our work centers, this is going to be under our trust set work centers because we're talking SGTs here and we're going to do integrations. So if we go into our trusted integrations, first thing we have is our ACI connections. So let's add an ACI connection here. And yeah, give it a name, use the FQDN or the IP address. We're gonna use IP address here. We're not gonna validate the ACI certificate in our uh, demo lab. We don't have a certificate on our ACI just yet. So we're gonna go ahead and go next. Now we can choose to either use the values that we get from ACI or we can append our own prefix or suffix 
to that value. Uh, now, the values that we can use are the different ones that you see at checkboxes for. We can see what the different types and values are here. If we use custom values or default attribute values, we're going to use the default attribute values because we're going to get those straight from ACI. And then this here is a list of what we can see from our ACI server. These are all EPGs. And then once we have, you know, EPG name, and then it shows you what the generated SGT name would be over in ACI. And then, of course, we can search that table if you're looking for a specific SGT or EPG. You have the option to set your own SGT numbering range. Otherwise, ICE will just do it for you. So if you want to have a specific numbering range for SGTs for your ACI connection, you can set that here. Now, we chose one EPG in the previous screen, so you don't have one EPG that's required here. So once we do that, we're going to say, look, we have that one synced EPG. If you select that one EPG, we're going to take a look at that. And we have our name conversions. Our, these are all synced. And then our, there we go. Now we have two. We can select more EPGs at that screen to add into our range. And you can see all of these fall underneath that default inbound rule. All right. So back over here in our HCI, we're going to take a look at our L3 outs. And the external EPGs that we're going to use in our L3 outs. And with that, we're going to create an outbound rule for these L3 outs. So this is to our Fabric ACI. Our Fabric ACI uh, SXP domain. And then our L3 out, we're going to choose. Oh, let's choose the one that we just opened up, which is our SDA L3 out. There we go. Now, in our rule configuration, this can be an AND or an OR here. We're going to keep it as an AND for this rule. We're going to use our SXP domains that we already created. And we're going to say if the SX, if we want to send all of these to our default SXP domain, and the SGT that we want to send to our default SGT domain is developers. We can add, you know, consumed and provided contracts here as well, if needed. Uh, we're going to do, let's say, web app contract. We're not going to do the provided contract. Add this here, and you can see that we have our new outbound rule. All right, our changes have been deployed. Go back over into... ACI, we can see that we have operational contracts and SGT endpoint. Oh, there's our four SGT endpoints that we're getting from ICE. And I think, oh, I was going to say, my recording stuck. But no, that's it. That's the verification that we're getting our S, uh, SGTs in from ICE here. Um, so that's how you would create your SGT to EPG rules within ICE. And you can see how they're already translated into API or ACI as soon as you go ahead and do that within ICE. Another one of our, well, I don't know why that's skipped. There we go. And skip my slide for a moment. <clears throat> so another feature that we have is we can change our file size limits and our uh, resets for our debug log. So if you're doing any debugging and you need your log files to be larger than what you currently have or what ICE is currently set it at, 
you can now override the default settings and put in however many or whatever size you want for your debug logs. You can add more file counts to it. So once you hit that size, it's going to create a new file and it's going to create a new file. So if you want to have 15 files of 60 megabyte, megabytes per, then you can do that. You can do 120 megabytes per and 25 files. So this is expandable to however you want it. And then when you want to reset this to default, so say you're done debugging and you don't want to have all of these log files fill up your uh, disk space, then you can reset your custom settings to the default settings on a specific time here. You can do it you know, today, sometime in the future, 10 minutes in the future, 30 minutes in the future. You're going to be done in four hours, set it for four hours. If you want it to run overnight, then set it for tomorrow at, today, at, at the time that it is today, so you have 24 hours, different things like that. So this is going to make debugging a lot easier to manage. And if you forget to turn off your debugging, this will do it for you. And the last one we're going to talk about is the Active Directory Preferred Domain Controller. And what this means is, you know how ICE uses uh, Active Directory sites and services and a couple internal algorithms to choose which domain controller to use if the primary domain controller that it's currently using is unreachable. And that has just been something that is set within ICE and there's no way to change it no matter what. So if you're having issues with one of your domains and it's propagating through you know, three or four of your domain controllers and ICE just runs down its list, you have that, uh, you have that uh, chance that you could just be going through damage domain control to damage domain control to damage domain controller. But if you know the order in which these should be running, then you are able to set the orders and the priorities for your domain controllers within ICE. Now, this is not something that we're actually going to demo here today because honestly, this should only be used with TAC guidance. If you're running into an issue with your authentications and you're having you know a, a long time out for your authentications or it's just not authenticating for you at all through your Active Directory domain controllers, then of course, uh, open up a TAC case and TAC will walk you through and they'll work with you to find the best order for your domain controllers to be able to put here. So <clears throat> that's really just to let you know that this option exists and we just don't want you to, to change these priorities and the orders uh, <laughs> lost that word the priorities and orders without knowing the back end uh situations that you could create by doing that okay so that's all we've got to talk about for ice 3.4 today but i do want to bring up that you know there's currently a migration offer for ice 2.7 licenses to 3.0 or 3.x licenses now, if you take a look at this, in the top left corner, you're going to see the offer validity ends in 22 September this year. And if you look at that red rectangle, that's also the last day of support for ICE 2.7. So those correlate and they match. So this offer is only available until ICE 2.7 is no longer supported, which is coming up pretty soon. Of course, we have all of our resources here. I know Rigo has done a really good job of putting all of the links and everything into the chat box. So our resources will be in the chat box if you want to go ahead and copy those and use those wherever and whenever you'd like. Again, that's all we've got for today. Thank you for joining the webinar.